Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Nathan Luthold? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Nathan Andrew Luthold was born in July 1975 and lived in the state of Illinois. When he was in grade school, he met a girl named Denise. They started dating in high school and became engaged while attending college in Minnesota. The couple married on July 15, 1995 and lived in Peoria, Illinois. Nathan found a job in sales and Denise worked for an insurance company, but then Nathan decided that he wanted to become a missionary. In preparation for this lifestyle, the couple moved in with Denise's parents, Doug and Diane Newton. In 1998, Nathan and Denise traveled to Lithuania in an effort to save the citizens there from eternal damnation. They came back to the United States and had two children. In 2002, they returned to Lithuania and functioned as missionaries there on and off until 2010. During this time, they had a third child. The couple helped a Lithuanian teenager named Ina Dobolate attend college in Pensacola, Florida. They originally met her when she was just six years old. Nathan traveled down to Florida and spent time with Ina, which led to her being kicked out of the college. School officials may have suspected that Nathan was demonstrating the missionary position. Ina moved into the Newton family house in Illinois, which again is where the Luthold family lived. Nathan was spotted riding around with Ina in his vehicle, which attracted the attention of his church. He was warned that he may lose financial support if he continued with his suspicious behavior. In the fall of 2012, Ina started attending a college in Chicago. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 14, 2013, Valentine's Day, at 3.11 p.m., Nathan called 911 and reported a burglary at the Newton family house. He told the operator that when he arrived at the house, he found the garage door open and broken glass in the doorway. Therefore, he decided not to enter. He was afraid an intruder was in the house. When the police arrived, they found Denise dead, face down in a pool of blood in the hallway near the front door. It was clear she had been murdered after entering the house. Here is what the police discovered during the course of their investigation. Denise had sustained a single gunshot wound to the back left side of her head, a live 40 caliber S&W cartridge, and a spent 40 caliber cartridge case were next to her head on the floor. Investigators determined that the gun used in the murder was a Glock pistol, but they never recovered the weapon. Denise's Ford Focus was found at Robinson Park, just down the street from the Newton family house. The key to the vehicle was in a trash can in the park. About 50 feet away from the vehicle, there was a pair of bloody gloves on a picnic table. Another key for the vehicle was found under Denise's body. This is certainly the key that she used to operate the vehicle that day, so the one found in the trash can must have been a spare. On the gear shift of the vehicle, DNA was found from two contributors, Denise and an unidentified male. Nathan could not be excluded as the source. The police searched the Newton family house. They noticed that someone had ransacked the kitchen and pulled a drawer out and placed it on the floor instead of simply dumping the contents. In front of the closet in the bedroom used by Nathan and Denise, there was a black hooded sweatshirt which contained gunshot residue. It also contained Nathan's DNA. There was a lockbox in the bedroom that normally contained a 40 caliber Glock pistol, but the weapon was missing. Denise had dropped her youngest child off at kindergarten at 12.15 p.m. She left just a few minutes later and went home. Nathan had been captured on surveillance video visiting various businesses on the day of the murder. At 11.31 a.m., he was seen leaving a Starbucks about seven minutes from the Newton family house. He returned to that same Starbucks at 12.45 p.m. A woman who was visiting a neighbor of the Newtons heard a gunshot between 12.30 and 12.40 p.m. The police believed that Nathan was the killer. Here was their theory of the crime. 
Nathan was having an affair with Ina, therefore he wanted to get rid of his wife, Denise. He drove his vehicle to the park, walked to the house, and staged the burglary. When his wife came home, he shot her just inside the doorway. Nathan then drove his wife's Ford Focus to the park, climbed into his vehicle, and drove back to Starbucks. Three weeks after the murder, Nathan was arrested for killing his wife. He went to trial in July of 2014. Nathan Luthold was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 80 years in prison. Now moving to my analysis. Nathan Luthold maintains his innocence and also denies having an affair with Ina. Despite the weight of the evidence against him, he has a few supporters. They argue that his wife must have been murdered by a mysterious intruder. The state, of course, disagrees. They believe Nathan is a cold-blooded killer. This brings me to the question, was Nathan guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. It seems clear that Nathan was having an affair with Ina, despite his denial. They spent a lot of time together and communicated frequently. About four months before the murder, Nathan sent an email to Ina in Lithuanian, which translated to, quote, I love you because of the dreams that we have together, because you are my world and my everything, unquote. Nathan regularly drove Ina to a spa and paid for her to get a wax. On Valentine's Day, Nathan texted Ina after the murder and mentioned how the house had been robbed. She responded with the word, interesting, followed by a smiley face. The murder occurred during a time when Nathan did not have an alibi. Several people lived in the Newton family residence, but the murder just happened to occur when Denise Luthold was coming home to an empty house. A key to Denise's Ford Focus was found under her body. The key that was found in the park trash can was a spare. Even if an intruder wanted to take her vehicle, which is unlikely, how did they find the spare key? Denise was murdered with the same type of pistol owned by Nathan, and his pistol was missing. The burglary appeared to be staged. When Nathan arrived home, he did not enter the residence due to a fear of encountering an intruder. Most people in the situation would have entered anyway. Nathan admitted that he was at the park on the day of the murder. A woman named Diane and her husband were driving in the area at around 12.20 p.m. when they saw a man in a black sweatshirt walking away from Robinson Park toward the Newton family house. Diane later identified Nathan out of a photo array. A black sweatshirt was found on the floor of the house. It contained gunshot residue and Nathan's DNA. The police examined Nathan's laptop there was never any indication that anyone used this laptop other than Nathan. It had been configured so that the internet browsing history would automatically delete, but this did not prevent the police from recovering some of the internet searches performed on the computer in the months leading up to the murder. Here are a few examples. Blow to the head. Hitting someone over the head to knock them out. How to electrocute. How to erase everything from iPad. How to hide the sound of a gunshot how to muffle a gunshot, how to silence a Glock 40, how to suppress a Glock 40, lethal injection, murder insulin, sleep-inducing drugs, what fumes, if inhaled, can make you pass out, where to buy potassium chloride, bathtub electrocution, and perhaps the most disturbing of them all, short-term furnished apartments, Pensacola, Florida. Nathan tried to explain the searches by saying that he was conducting research about preventing self-harm to young people in Lithuania. This is incredibly difficult to believe. Is there really an epidemic in Lithuania of young people using suppressed 40 caliber S&W Glock pistols to harm themselves? If this was true, why would a quieter gunshot be valuable to them under those circumstances? A note written by Nathan's wife Denise was found in her day planner, it didn't look too good for Nathan. It read, quote, What on earth could you possibly be thinking? I can't imagine anything you could tell me that would hurt worse than what you are doing to me now, every day. I've never been good enough, never done enough. I know that you want me dead. I am not stupid. You want to humiliate me by running around with a 20-year-old? Fine. If I haven't pleased you in 17 years, nothing I do will please you and I refuse to leave my children just because you have decided to do this to me. You are the only person who thinks that I am a bad mother. How long are you going to do this to me? Oh yeah, 
until I break. That's what you said, isn't it? Well, happy waiting, unquote. A jailhouse informant testified that Nathan revealed his involvement in the murder after the informant pretended that he was going to give Nathan legal advice. The informant knew details about the crime, which were not publicly known, like searches made by Nathan, including the word potassium, and how Nathan was worried about having been spotted by a woman when he was walking to the house from the park. Moving to the exculpatory factors, the police believe the burglary was staged, but several items were stolen from the house, including two firearms, jewelry, a computer, and a camera. Even though the neighbor, Diane, identified Nathan, her husband, who was in the vehicle with her, believed the man he saw was black. Nathan claimed that he fired his 40 caliber S&W Glock two weeks earlier. This could explain the gunshot residue on the black sweatshirt. The timeline for the murder was fairly tight if Nathan was the perpetrator. The murder occurred sometime between 12.30 and 12.40 p.m., yet Nathan arrived at the Starbucks at 12.45 p.m. Ina testified that there was no affair, despite all the communication between Nathan and Ina, and there was a lot. Neither had images of the other on their electronic devices. The jailhouse informant who testified against Nathan had no credibility, just like all jailhouse informants. When considering the evidence, do I believe that Nathan was guilty of murder? Yes, I believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory my opinion. Nathan and Denise grew apart as their marriage progressed. Eventually, Nathan found a new lover and wanted to dispose of Denise. Nathan was cowardly, vindictive, insecure, petty, sadistic, impulsive, self-centered, immature, and had poor critical thinking skills. He decided to commit the murder, but did not have any idea of how to do it. This is why he searched items related to electrocution, insulin, potassium chloride, and firearms. Nathan decided to use his own pistol in the murder, but did not know how to operate it properly. For example, he left a live cartridge next to his wife's body. He probably ejected the cartridge by manually cycling the weapon when he was trying to figure out how to use it. After committing the murder, Nathan didn't bother to retrieve the live cartridge or the spent case. He also left his sweatshirt in the house. Concerned about the timeline of his fabricated alibi, Nathan decided to use his wife's vehicle to drive to the park. This is something an intruder would have never done. Ultimately, this case featured a lazy, manipulative, and desperate husband who shot his wife with his own gun and made up an unbelievable story. Denise was aware that Nathan was cheating and that he wanted her dead. She knew he was duplicitous, but assumed that he would not move into the realm of the homicidal. She had too much faith in a person being unfaithful, which is something Nathan was counting on to bring her a lethal Valentine's Day gift. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Nathan Luthold can be summarized in this way. A missionary and his mate marched a ministry to Lithuania to mend souls from misery's maw. The minister's morals morphed and he mutilated his marital manifesto by making murky romantic motions toward a maiden. After migrating his mistress to the mainland, he maintained the masquerade. Maddened by matrimony's monotony, and mesmerized by his magnetic muse, the minister maliciously murdered his mate and masked the mayhem as a mishap. His misdeed marked him for a maximum security mansion, a monument to his malevolence. Those are my thoughts on the case of Nathan Luthold. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.